Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to start the service a little differently this morning. I know you're just, some of you are just coming in. You're not late. We are going to do a hymn sing, uh, which is what the 8 a.m. crowd used to do almost every Sunday. So we're going to do that about once a month through the summer. So if you haven't done this before, you are going to grab one of those blue books in your pews. The words are not going to be on the screen. Those blue books are called hymnals. You might want to blow the dust off the cover. Um, crack it open, leaf through it, find your favorite hymn, or just pick a number. Um, if you raise your hand, it will, um, you'll have a better chance of getting your hymn in. We're going to do three of these, one verse of each. Tommy is going to lead us in singing, and then we will get our service started. So does anyone have a hymn to start us off? I see a hand. 314. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses and he walks with me. And he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Yeah, in the back there. 77. <clears throat> seven, seven. <laughs> My God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the words thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displays. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. What was your number? Four, six, Speak in living earth. 
Thank you, Tommy and Ashley and Josh, for leading us in a hymn sing, a, an old tradition that we just love doing around here once in a while. My name is Pastor Lauren, and um, I am so grateful to have you here this morning. Now, today is Laity Sunday, so I'll stop talking pretty soon and hand over the reins. You'll see me here and there, but mainly this service is run by these wonderful people behind me and the lady who run our cameras all the time and the musicians and everybody uses their gifts together. And we celebrate that as the body of Christ. With the unique gifts that we have, that is what makes the church. Not the pastors, not the staff. It's all of you who make the church. And so we celebrate you today. And we are so grateful to be in worship. Now, there was a rumor that our water wasn't working. If you heard that, it's not true anymore. It's working. So use the bathrooms wherever you like. Wash your hands wherever you like. Everything is working now. Thank you to our team for fixing that. So I want to invite you into worship. I want to invite you to turn your focus towards God. Let's use this day to celebrate what God has given us and to use the gifts and graces that he has granted. Let us go to worship to the Lord. rise and join me in the call to worship. Let us begin together with the voice of many. Listen, Listen. Wisdom, wisdom is calling. Before all began, God, word, and wisdom, creating, calling from the foundations of the deep. Listen, Listen. Wisdom, wisdom is calling. From the mountaintops, earth, fields, and sea, creating, calling, from the foundations of the deep. Listen, wisdom is calling. To those who suffer, God's love is given. Endurance blossoms from the foundations of the deep. Listen, wisdom is calling. Daily, God's delight. You, me, everyone, given hope, grace, 
love as the foundations of our lives. Listen, Listen wisdom, wisdom is calling. calling. Poured into our hearts that we may become Christ's hand and heart. Love as the foundation of our lives. Listen, Listen wisdom, wisdom is calling. calling. kids to join me up front. All right, friends, we have a couple of friends still coming up. But I have a question for you. Does anybody know, what does it mean to be smart? What does, you know the opposite of smart? You know what? Oh, Chase. <laughs> That's fun sibling stuff, right? But smart, does that mean you know a lot of facts? Maybe you're really, really good at math? Can, not always. Not always. Sometimes that can be an example. It's your, in your families, can you think of who the smartest person in your family is? Is it you? Yeah? <laughs> your mom's the smartest? What about at school? Do you know, remember who like the smartest kid in your class was? No? Yeah, you do? The teacher is definitely one of the smartest people in the class. <laughs> yeah, and then you think the principal's the smartest? That's a good one. I know, I think, I think here at the preschool, teacher Mindy was like the smartest person, don't you? <laughs> It does have your name on it. And then, does anybody know the difference between just being smart and being wise? Is that a tough question? Yeah, what do you think, Ellie? Wise means you have, wise, you have experience. Yeah, wise means you can have experience. And it also means it's just not knowing something, it's putting something into action, right, that you know. So it might be smart to know that you should brush your teeth twice a day at least, right? But being wise is actually doing it, right? What about knowing it's safest to wear a helmet if you ride your bike and skateboard or rollerblade? A helmet on, yeah. So is it... Yeah. 
Yeah, some yeah. Yeah, so it's important. So wisdom is because we know we should wear the helmet. Wisdom is wearing that helmet when we ride the bike. Or like John said, when we walk our dogs, we should have our dog on a leash, right? That's being wise. You saw somebody not do this? So what if I, t what if I told you that I think kids are even more wise than adults? You think it's true? You don't think it's true? You're skeptical of that fact that I think? It, it depends on the adult and the child. You have a boo-boo. Oh, we'll have to get a band-aid for that in Sunday school. But let me give you some examples of why I think kids are more wise than adults. So I think that kids are more wise than adults because you guys embrace imagination. And even if you're bored, you still have a fun way to do stuff. You don't worry about being busy all the time like adults can. And that's pretty wise. I also think kids are wise because anywhere you go, you all make friends. And that's a wise thing, that you want to be in community with other people all the time. The biggest, one big thing I think, and that I know all of you are, is that kids are all, like, honest a lot, right? You tell me what you're thinking pretty much all the time. I don't have to guess. Yeah. And then the biggest thing, and I know this is something that as an adult I struggle with, but you guys are never afraid to ask for help. And I think that is so wise, because sometimes adults might wait a long time to ask, but you guys, you'll try, and if it doesn't work, you ask right away. And that's what makes you so wise. So friends, let's pray together. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for knowledge, and thank you for wisdom. Help us to learn and make wise choices. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we can head to Sunday school, friends. Today's Old Testament reading is from Proverbs, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 and 22 through 31. It is entitled, The Gifts of Wisdom. Doesn't wisdom cry out and understanding shout? Atop the heights along the path, at the crossroads she takes her stand, by the gate before the city, at the entrance, she shouts, I cry out to you, people. My voice goes out to all humanity. The Lord created me at the beginning of his way, before his deeds long in the past. I was formed in ancient times, at the beginning, before the earth was. When there was no watery depths, I was brought forth. When there was no springs flowing with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before God made the earth and the fields, or the first of the dry land, I was there when he established the heavens, when he marked out the horizon on the dark sea when he thickened the clouds above, when he secured the fountains of the deep, when he set a limit for the sea so the water wouldn't go beyond his command, when he marked out the earth's foundation, I was beside him as the master of crafts. I was having fun, smiling before him all the time, frolicking with his inhabited earth, and delighting in the human race. God's word for God's people. When I gaze in 
into the night skies and see the work of your fingers. The moon and stars suspended in space. Oh, what is man that you And have made him a little lower than the angels. You have put him in charge of all creation, the beasts of the fields, the fish of the sea. What is man, oh, what is man that you are mindful of him? O Lord our God, the majesty and glory of your name. Transcends the earth and fills the heavens. O Lord our God, little children praise you perfectly, and so would we, and so. and glory on your name. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. If you've been attending Paradise Valley for a while, you know how amazing our people are here. You know that not only do we have incredible volunteers, but we have dedicated staff. Today, John Bowers is going to lead us in a, the sermon. He's going to guide us in our message, and John is one of our co-lay leaders. And I have a feeling he'll explain what that is in his message, so I'll save that for him. But also, we have staff that are very dedicated to the mission of this church, and I want to recognize two of them before my prayer because I want us to extend hands towards these people as we pray. They're sitting right here in front of me. We have Sherry Paris and Mickey Price.
They have been here for many years, and I'm, they may not want me to tell you, <laughs> but it's been a long time. Sherry has led our children in singing, and for me personally, I have littles, and she has gotten them excited about music. And Mickey has managed our finances and helped us be responsible with what the resources we have. So as we enter into prayer, I want to invite you to just extend a hand out to them, um, and we're going to offer them a blessing, and then I'll move into a pastoral prayer. Another person who is not here today, but we will celebrate, is Mindy Sabraski when she can come back. And so um, let's go into prayer together in gratitude for the community that we have around us. Holy and precious God, we are so grateful for all that you have given to this church. We are grateful for the gifts and graces you have provided, and we specifically lift up Sherry and Mickey this morning. Thank you for the many years they have dedicated to being your love in action. Thank you for the gifts you have given them and the joys you have brought through those gifts. They have planted seeds among many, and we know that it will turn into fruit-bearing trees. It is through your spirit that we honor what they have done here. And we ask for a special blessing as they head into the next chapter of their life, either retirement or another opportunity. We are your people, God, and we trust that you guide us every step of the way. We pray that we are the people who will feed the hungry, who will help the thirsty have water, who will give shelter to those in need. Oh, but God, we confess that we forget that sometimes. When we see the gas prices, we think about how it hurts our paycheck rather than those who have to choose between filling up their car or feeding their children dinner. We remember those who have to make those choices. Forgive us, God, for not remembering those people and to help us to think of them. Help us to think of your world. Give us the conviction to move and to share what we have to bring your peace on earth. We remember those who are fighting against gun violence. We remember those who have to speak up and those who have lost loved ones to guns. We pray for our leaders of our country and our state and our cities that they would be wise and make choices that help bring peace and not continuous carnage. We pray for the entire world. We pray for the violence throughout the world, and we remember Ukraine specifically as they actively battle a chemical plant fire after being rampaged. God, would you bring healing would you bring peace through your love? We know that that love shines through us, your people. It is through your spirit that you will use us to change the world. We pray that we would be attentive to the gifts you have given us, to the voices you have given us, to the abilities you have given us to bring that peace that you so long for. And so we pray all of this, all the things that were said and the things that were not said, and we pray together as your people in one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The Gospel reading is from the book of John, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. And this is as spoken by Jesus. I have much more to say to you, but you can't handle it now. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He won't speak on his own, but he will say whatever he hears and will proclaim to you what is to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and proclaim it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. That's why I said that the Spirit takes what is mine and will proclaim it to you. God's word for God's people. I'd like to start out with special thanks to Ashley and Tommy and Josh for the beautiful music, the inspiring music, and particularly for singing the majesty and glory of your name for, for Susan and me. It's one of our favorite anthems uh, in the Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis where Susan and I met. We went on a mission music trip to Scotland. And this was one of the anthems that we prepared for that trip. Psalm 8 has become one of my favorite psalms. And I don't know, did you even realize that what you heard sung was this morning's psalm reading? And it is, in fact, the text that I've chosen for this message. I am particularly touched by this psalm for the words it gives us about wisdom and and about worship. And part of why this psalm is so special to me is because uh, of Tom Fetke's musical arrangement that uh, really connects the message of the psalm in, with, with the arts and with the soul. And Linda Lee Johnson's poetry, which is a, uh, actually a, uh, a paraphrase of the psalm, that raises the part about the, uh, the children praising God perfectly. It really raises that to the center point of, of the message. And I think that is as it should be. And that's a big piece of the message that I aim to share with you this morning. Uh, I wonder how many of you have actually had occasions where you've opened the Bible and you've found a gift that helped you with what you had to do that day. And that's exactly the way I felt when I looked at the lectionary readings and found that I was going to get to preach on Psalm 8 today. So how did I come to be preaching to you this morning? Uh, Lauren told you a little bit about it. I'm here because I'm a, one of the lay leaders of this congregation. Lisa Lamont at this same time is preaching in the Ignite service. I am also here and I feel confident about doing this because I am part of the lay servant program. I am a certified lay servant. It's a training program unique to the United Methodist Church and a very Methodist program because it trains and empowers lay people to do leadership things of all sorts in the churches. Things that range from leading small groups to leading prayer to perhaps even being a lay minister responsible for the worship in the activities of a church. Susan and I would love at some other time to, to talk to you at length about the lay servant program. It's quite an opportunity. But getting back closer to our subject, we know that Moses liked to walk up the mountain when he had a day off. So I looked this up on the internet to find out what he did there. It turns out that they must have had a nice golf course somewhere up the mountain. I learned that one day Moses, Jesus, the, whole, the Holy Spirit, and this old man were playing golf. They got to a water hole. Moses was first to tee off. He took his shot and sliced and went right into the water. You know, Moses knew what to do. He took his staff out of his bag, walked out, parted the water, took a second shot, very nice chip shot, you know, about a cubit away from the hole. Good position. 
Holy Spirit goes next. It took a good swing, but same thing happens. Uh, she slices, uh, but as the ball veers off towards the water, the earth shakes, there are flames in the sky, and this breeze comes up and catches her ball and woofs it right over onto the green. You know, not a bad place to be. Jesus is up next, and he lines up his shot, takes his swing. <laughs> Darn if he didn't go into the water too. Uh, so Jesus is on top of this. He walks out on the water, takes another shot from there, and he ends up even closer to the hole than, than what uh, Moses landed. So then the old man steps up. And, you know, he kind of jives the other guys a little and lines up his shot and, you know, makes sure he's ready. And there goes his ball once again right into the water. But out of nowhere comes this frog, grabs his ball, and then before the frog can run off, this eagle swoops down, grabs the frog, heads off towards the copse of trees that's on the other side of the green. Well, in the middle of all this, the frog drops the ball, plop right on the green, rolls right into the hole, hole in one for the old man. Moses turns to Jesus, you know, I really hate playing golf with your dad. Today's Trinity Sunday on the church calendar. I'm not going to try to explain the Trinity to you. I tried that once. Actually, Susan did. If that's what you came here for today, I'm sorry. You'll need to come back next year. I will comment on the, that the idea of the Trinity goes way back. Uh, we learned this spring that in ancient Egypt, generally in the time when Moses was there as a baby in a basket hidden in the reeds on the bank of the Nile. The Egyptians had this idea of the most important three of their pagan gods uh, were typically depicted as a trinity in their temple art. And so it is with some of the other ancient religions. It should not sur surprise us that this imagery did come to be used later to describe our God, the one true God, a God whose powers were greater than we could imagine for any single person, that the image of a trinity might be helpful understanding that. But I want to remind you, and this gets back to Moses in the mountain, when Moses did go up the mountain in a biblical sense, here's what God told him. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus later added to this, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty simple, isn't it? One God, period. Two simple commandments. Love God, love neighbor. Four words. Jesus himself struggled to make things simple enough for his followers to understand. Hence his statement in today's gospel reading. I have much more to tell you, but you cannot handle it now. Ah, uh, to only understand what Jesus is really trying to tell us. That's usually the issue, isn't it? That's why we have to pray. That's what we think about every morning when we get up and look at the sunshine and ask what Jesus wants us to do today. This is indeed the quest of wisdom. And the author, author of Proverbs tells us, we read this this morning, doesn't wisdom cry out and doesn't understanding shout? Atop the heights, along the path, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. By the gate before the city, at the entrances, she shouts. I cry out to you people. My voice goes out to all of humanity. God desires for us to have understanding, but God's people are very good at making things complicated. Can't we ever learn to make things simple? I think now we're ready to dig into Psalm 8, and I'll continue for the most part 
to use the paraphrase that Tom sung for us this morning. When I gaze into the night skies and see the works of your fingers, the moon and stars suspended in space, what is man that you are mindful of him? You have given man a crown of glory and honor and have made him a little lower than the angels. You have put him in charge of all creation, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Oh, what is man? What is man that you are mindful of him? Oh, Lord our God, the majesty and glory of your name transcends the earth and fills the heavens. Oh, Lord our God, Little children praise you perfectly. And so would we. And so would we. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. Let's try to unpack these words. When I gaze into the night skies and see the work of your fingers, the moon and stars suspended in space. Oh, what is man that you are mindful of him? Have ever, ever you been out on a dark, clear, really starry night? What did you see? How did you feel? Stars too numerous to count. Points of light in the sky. A milky way that looks as if some godly person spilled cream across the sky. How big it is, how small we are. What is man that you are mindful of him, O oh Lord? Some of you know that I'm a Navy veteran. And there's nothing much darker than a Navy ship in the middle of the night. It's not like a cruise ship where they never turn off the lights. And when I stand deck watches at night, it amazes me how often an innocent comment about the stars and the stars and the moon and the sky turns into a deep theological discussion just out of nowhere among people who thought they were just there to safely navigate through their watch. What are human beings that you are mindful of them? What are mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them little more than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. I hope you don't mind that I changed translations here. I wanted to read this without the male imagery that, that we heard in the anthem. The anthem was written in 1979, a less sensitive time. But I did not want to skip over this thought. Paul references this in his letter to the Hebrews. God didn't put the world that is coming, the world that we are talking about, under the angel's control. Instead, someone declared somewhere, what is humanity that you think about them? Or what are human beings that you care about them? For a while, you made them lower than angels. You crowned human beings with glory and honor. You put everything under their control. Then Paul went on to explain how human beings, you and me, are to come into our glory. Right now, we don't see everything under mankind's control, not yet. However, we do see the one who was made lower in order that, than the angels for a little while. The one who was made lower than the angels for a little while. That's Jesus. He's the one who is now crowned with glory and honor. Do you get that? Jesus is one with God. We are one with Jesus. That makes us one with God. How simple is that? 
And then in today's reading from the Gospel according to John, Jesus says, everything that the Father has is mine. That's why I, Jesus, said that the Spirit takes what is mine and will proclaim it to you. God did not crown us with glory and honor because of anything we did or because of anything special about us. We were Jesus' crown of glory and honor because we are one with Jesus. The glory and honor that are Christ's are his to share with us, and indeed he has. It is that simple. Let's go on. O Lord our God, the majesty and glory of your name transcends the earth and fills the heavens. O Lord our God, little children praise you perfectly, and so would we. Alleluia. Did any of you see the recent Baby Blues comic strip where Zoe is coaching Hammy for a show-and-tell project? Did you see that? She uses a metaphor about Mommy Wanda's casserole to help Hammy. She says, public speaking is 10% content and 90% filler. Now that's the wisdom of the children, and that was a big help to me this morning. Little children praise you perfectly, and so would we. Leo Tolstoy wrote a short story called Little Girls Wiser Than Men, and the story goes like this. The scene is Holy Week in a small Russian village. It is early springtime, and the snow is just melting. Two little girls, cousins, go outside to play, eager to show off their new Easter dresses. The older girl cautions that they need to be careful not to get dirty, but the younger girl goes straight to a mud puddle, splashes around, gets both of them wet. The older girl ends up running home crying about what's happened to her dress. Well, her mother runs out, the other mother runs out, they start trading accusations. Pretty soon the entire village is out in the street arguing about what's wrong with the children today. In the meantime, the older of the two girls has gone home, cleaned off her dress, she's had a good cry, comes back out to play some more as if nothing has ever happened. The two girls get back together happily. They make a little boat out of a piece of bark, sail up in the mud puddle, watch it go down through a little rivulet of draining water, happy as can be. The grandmother comments, you know, we have a lot to learn from these children about forgiveness. Let's take this into our own hearts. Little children praise you perfectly, and so would we. So we're going to be talking about the wisdom of the children. And my thanks to Kristen for warming you up to this thought. We have much to learn from young people's non-judgmental acceptance from their unconditional love, from their sincere forgiveness, and from their unfettered imagination. We're going to go a little deeper into all of these points with a few stories. I want to start out addressing the cute and inappropriate things that children say. It kind of gets us into the mood of understanding their innocence. Susan and I have no children of our own, but we love to borrow our great nieces and great nephews. Our three-year-old niece, Evelyn, recently surprised us while we were out in a trip to the children, actually to Child's Play, Tommy's Theater. Uh, but uh, she encountered a a noisy and smelly episode of gas, shall we say. And instead of saying, excuse me, she proudly remarked, tutti frutti. I don't think I'll ever be able to think of that ice cream flavor the same way again. But the children have much more to teach us than just humorous expressions. I'm sure all of you have had the experience of deciding what to do when a child, one who doesn't know you, unexpectedly makes eye contact with you. What are you going to do? 
It may have already happened to you in the sanctuary this morning. The family in front of you, the kid pops up over mommy's shoulder and looks you in the eyes with that look on her face and says, Mommy, Mommy, there are people behind us. Did you know that? What are you going to do about this? Well, you can pick up your hymnal and uh, try to figure out what the next song is. You can make prayer hands and close your eyes. That makes the kid go away, right? At least invisible. Third choice is to make eye contact and see if something miraculous is going to happen. See if you can help a God moment occur. Susan has demonstrated that she's able to do this across a busy room in a restaurant. And it's a gift that I think we all of us get into from time to time. Children have no monopoly on unfettered imagination. Dave Summers sat down with me in a coffee shop three years ago to talk about an idea that Larry Heights had about turning around the attendance decline of our church. Larry had a history of turning around struggling businesses and thought that things might be different if we could raise some money to find out what successful growing Methodist churches are doing. And yes, there are successful growing Methodist churches. And learn how to do some of those things here. This was the birth of the Growth and Vitality campaign. And I was to lead the prayer element of that campaign. Larry's Growth and Vitality initiative, Larry's flight of imagination, led us to learn how to do video streaming, how to do online version, worship. It led us to develop a connection team that was out there this morning greeting people, helping people make friends, helping people feel at home here. The most recent work of Growth and Vitality is the new lighting that makes it possible for me to walk away from the pulpit without stepping into darkness so you can still see me talk. Imagination, one big piece of the wisdom of the children, can help grown-ups do God's work. Many of you know John Katoff, a member of our church who founded the national organization Open Table, not the one that does restaurant reservations, the one whose goal it is to involve disadvantaged people in relationships that will equip them to participate fully in society. I first met John in a meeting of our generosity team. This was several years ago at a time when our church had just adopted its welcoming statement, a statement that, that among other things, tells us that we will be welcoming to diversity in gender identities. There are people in our church family that didn't like that, and there were families that left the church and withdrew their financial report. John wanted the generosity team to know that he was angry about that. But John's message to us was not one of, how can we get even with these people? It was a message of, what can we do about this? How can we become generous enough? How can we become activist enough about social causes that these people will not keep us from becoming God's word in action. How can we make our actions match our words? Well, PVMC is still working on how to be God's, God's love in action and how to become a fountain of unconditional love for all of God's children. But I would suggest to you that the children already understand how to do this. Perhaps you are familiar with Robert Fulgham's book, All I Really Need to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. This is really what I'm trying to say this morning. The important things that we do in church and in life are all about practicing unconditional love, offering sincere forgiveness, practicing a non-judgmental innocence that allows us to accept others as they are. Exercising a rich imagination of what God in his or her great power 
can make happen in our lives. In all of this, we must learn to praise God in the joyful ways of the children. O oh Lord our God, little children praise you perfectly, and so would we. Alleluia. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the majesty and glory of your name transcends the earth and fills the heavens. We give you thanks that we can know your grace, even if we cannot fully understand it. Your vastness, goodness, and love are more than we could attempt to comprehend. Teach us, Lord, to love you in the innocent, trusting manner of children. Grant us the imagination to appreciate what you can make possible for us and to give us the strength to do your good work in the world. Amen. As John spoke about little children praising God perfectly, it may, I kept thinking about last night we had water games here for our kids. So just about 14 hours ago, imagine the campus just covered with giant water slides and kids screaming and um, throwing water balloons at each other. And can you hear the, the, the joyful noises? So when we praise God, we do it with joy. And one of those ways that we praise is by giving of our resources whether that be our time and our money, it's all done with joy because we are celebrating what God has given us and we are returning it to the world that he has provided us. And so as we come to our offering time, we ask that you consider where God is calling you to give of your time and your resources to further God's love in the world. I invite the ushers forward. Oh! 
precious God, we thank you for the gifts that you have provided. We pray that you would help us use them to bring your light to the world. Amen. Before we head out, we have a just two announcements for you today. The very good one is if you're a sweets lover, we are going to celebrate Sherry and Mickey today with cake because that's what we do. <laughs> And of course, every week we have donuts and coffee. So do you think that we didn't get donuts today? No, of course, we always get donuts. So there's donuts and cake. You get it all. You get the best. <laughs> it will just be down in the Fellowship Center. Please join us after the service. And if you've known Mickey and Sherry, please be sure to let them know how much they mean to you. And I should tell you, they're not leaving our church. They'll still be here. But let's celebrate them today. And finally, in two weeks from today, we have our annual church conference. Um, so we do this every year. We go through our business and the changes we've had and really the dreams that we have for the next year. So we vote on a few things. You learn about what's going on in the church. We hope that you can come next week right here in this room after the service. And now I'll hand it over to our leaders here for our final hymn. in a 
Christ our Savior here. Lift we then our human voices in the songs that faith would bring. We live with and in human choices, lives that like our music sing. Alleluia, alleluia, joined in love our praises ring. Hear now this call. Love your neighbor with the simple, unquestioning love of children. Accept your neighbor as they are without judgment. Forgive your neighbor with sincerity as the children do. Use your imagination to envision the great things that God is already doing in your life and will continue to do for you and with you. And above all, Praise God with joy, as the children do. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and every day. Go in peace. Amen.